Okay, everyone can hear me, I hope. Yeah? Okay, this is a pretty decent crowd for a WebAssembly talk at a Java conference, so um, I'm, I'll, I'll take it, you know? Thanks. Um, yeah, so my name is Dan Phillips. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about WebAssembly, uh, specifically uh, something that seems simple, but uh, to newcomers can be difficult, uh, which is getting data in and out of a WebAssembly module and the different techniques involved. Uh, quickly, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm an engineer at Loophole Labs, which is a uh, small startup that focuses mostly on networking tools, um, but we also do a bit of WebAssembly. I'm here with my colleague, Shivansh Vidge, uh, who spoke yesterday, and he did a deep dive on the uh, differences and similarities between the JVM and the WebAssembly VM. So I highly recommend checking that out if you're curious about that. That was a more high level uh, with lots of different um, interesting tidbits. This is going to be a little bit more in the weeds uh, with WASM specifically, um, but uh, definitely worth checking out. So uh, at Loophole, we built a thing called the scale function runtime. Uh, you could also call it the scale plugin runtime. It is a, uh, a function runner, a plugin system that uh, leverages WebAssembly under the hood, and I'm going to be using that today and talking about it um, and talking about a little bit about how we built it. Uh, on the internet, I'm D underscore Phila, so on Twitter or whatever it's called these days, um, check it out there. Uh, also on GitHub, uh, D Phila, and on um, LinkedIn. And also, uh, I'm from Chicago in the US. Uh, if you're ever in town, I run the WASM Chicago group. We do events and we have speakers. If you'd like to speak, if you ever get interested in WebAssembly, uh, or if you're just curious to learn more, check it out, wasmchicago.org. OK, so I guess quickly, I would wonder, how many people have used WebAssembly here? Two, yes. OK, good, good, good. Hey, that's. That's more than I thought. That's excellent. OK, great. Um, but we've heard of it, obviously. Yeah? OK, great. Um, so we're just going to talk about some of the, uh, the overarching themes of, of it uh, before we get into the details. But this is from the spec. WebAssembly, which is also known as WASM, 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 it doesn't matter. Uh, it's a safe, portable, low-level code format that is designed for efficient execution and compact representation, which is a nice sounding sentence. Um, but what does that mean specifically? So what it, what it means in practice is that it's a safe sandbox execution environment, which has a deny by default model. And very importantly, it makes no assumption about languages that are compiled to it uh, or the host on which it's running. The best way to think about it, I think, is that it's a virtualized CPU, right? Um, and uh, that becomes very important as we talk about what it can do and uh, how, it's, how it's used. So, Right, it's a compilation target. Um, it is a virtual ISA, right? So instead of being like a low-level ISA, it's virtualized. Um, and uh, much like the JVM we've we talked about the other day, it's that it's a stack machine. So what does this mean exactly? In a broad sense, WASM is just another architecture. Okay, you can think of it like uh, another target, like x86, right? Key differences are that it's virtualized. And that means it needs a runtime to translate the binary format that is WebAssembly into machine code. And that can be a JIT, it can be JITted, it can be AOT, there's lots of different options for that. Um, and it's a universal, right? This is sort of the idea. Um, uh, and a question that, that we get a lot, uh, especially at this conference when we talk to people who are not super familiar with it, is that, yeah, it's a, it's a client-side technology, right? It's a browser thing. It's used with JavaScript. Um, that's, that's typically what most people hear about it and what most people have heard about it. Um, from the spec, again, it, it being safe sandbox execution environment, it makes no assumption about languages or hosts. Very important. Um, some differences here, though, is that the, uh, if, if this is a safe sandbox, one key element to it is that the cold start times are, uh, they can be nanoseconds or microseconds, depending on what's being executed. Uh, and it's also universal, right? We've, we've uh, heard of this phrase before, write once, run anywhere. Yeah, sure. So uh, the, a similar ethos um, is uh, involved in the WASM space. Though uh, we're trying to make sure, uh, we're working very hard to make sure that it's not write once, debug everywhere, right? Yeah. 
Um, and this is a joke in the WebAssembly community, is that WASM is neither really about the web, nor is it about assembly, right? Um, and uh, it's, we'll sort of get into the details of why that's true here. Server-side WebAssembly. Who's heard of people using WASM on the server? Cool. Okay, great. This is going to go, this is, this is excellent. So one thing that we do at Loophole is um, we are leveraging this on the server because of its unique properties. I like to think of WebAssembly as kind of having this cloud infrastructure penicillin moment, right? A penicillin discovery where uh, we were working hard to uh, make something for the browser that was sandboxed and polyglot by definition and extensible. Um, but then we thought, hey, wait a second. If you take a step back and squint maybe, uh, it kind of looks like something, um, maybe like a container, maybe like a VM, maybe smaller, right? Um, and what, what it turns out to be is that it's smaller, it's safer, it's faster, which I should have put an asterisk here because it's faster in certain contexts, uh, and it's much more universal. Um, this is a famous quote from the founder of Docker. If you can read that, he says, uh, you know, if WASM had existed in 2008, they wouldn't have needed to create Docker. Um, that's how important it is. Uh, and this is someone who looked at different isolation, isolation technologies going back to the early 2000s, um, and we'll get more into why this is, why this is the case. Oop, let's go back first. Yep, okay. So, uh, Java and WebAssembly. Seems like an interesting pairing, but there's a couple things to talk about here before I get into the meat of the talk. I just wanted to mention this because of the conference. Uh, we're really excited to be here. Um, I'll fully admit that I, I'm not personally a Java person. My colleague Shiv is more than I am, and uh, we've had a really good time learning a lot about uh, the Java community and the ecosystem here. So, <clears throat> there are a couple things that you can do right off the bat. Um, we think about WebAssembly, there's a host which is provided by the runtime, and that host executes the, the WASM itself. So if you want to use uh, Java compiled to WASM, you can use this cool project called TVM. Uh, TVM is a compiler that uh, compiles Java to WASM. It's great. And then on the host side, let's say you have a Java program, um, say even in a framework, you can actually use GraalVM for this. So GraalVM has its own um, WebAssembly runtime built in. You can use it to execute WebAssembly modules through Graal. But how we do that is sort of the crux of this talk. Just as a, by way of example, you could take a, a simple function like this in Java, and you can use TVM, target WebAssembly. Uh, it'll output the WASM binary, right? And what you get is something that if you were to print it out into this format, which is, this is similar to sort of the interstitial format that you'll get with uh, x86 if you want to read assembly. This is like reading assembly for WebAssembly. Um, this is an example. This is called the WebAssembly text format. But basically, <clears throat> this is a text, a textual representation of the WASM binary itself from that Java uh, function that we just, that we just saw. Um, and then to run that, let's say you wanted to run that in a browser, you would do something like this, and I'm going to talk about these steps here throughout the next slides. Um, but uh, in the script tag, right, in the load wasm function, you uh, basically grab the binary, you set up a buffer, which is very important, which we'll talk about here soon, you instantiate the module, and then you export it, right, and then you can call that module from JavaScript. That's on the client. <clears throat> On the server, you can do the same thing. I don't know if we have any people who, who do Go for fun. Anybody do Golang for fun? Okay, cool, all right. So we're mostly a Go shop. Um, we do a lot of Go and Rust, C and C++, things like that. But this is the same exact thing, but running on the server, okay? Um, oh, I messed up the name of the file, but it's mostly the same thing, okay? So uh, same, same idea. You grab the WASM binary, you instantiate a new module, you have uh, we're using WA0, which is a uh, zero dependency Golang runtime for WebAssembly. We've actually worked quite closely with their team on uh, this WebAssembly runtime, and we use it in our own products. And this, this does the same thing. So it'll, it'll execute that Java source code that was turned into WebAssembly in a Go host. Okay, so <clears throat> when you first encounter WebAssembly, uh, one thing that most people notice is that it's very primitive, right? In the most literal sense also. Um, WebAssembly functions just return floats and ints, 32 and 64. That's it, right? And you're thinking, wow, what can I even do with this? 
you don't really have any other data types out of the box right now, right, as far as returns. <clears throat> so how do we use higher level types? Well, the key to high level types is by using WASM's linear memory, right? And if you notice in the first example, specifically the JavaScript one, it was a little clearer, uh, you can access a module's memory from the runtime and inside the guest itself. So what we do is we need to be able to read and write to and from the WASM memory space, which will be used in the WASM guest module itself. Okay, and then we will serialize and de deserialize to higher level types on either side. This is an example from a JavaScript runtime, which could be the browser, could be Node.js, which Node.js also has built-in WASM execution support. Um, but you'll see on the left, we have the JS side, which you would say is the host. And then on the right, you have the WebAssembly side, which is the guest. And then between the two, you have a linear memory buffer or a byte slice, right? Um, this, is, this is the key to getting data in and out. Of course, this seems very, very primitive, right? So the steps involved with doing this, uh, the, the, I, the IO, if you will, of the WASM module, go something like this. <clears throat> in the host, you serialize data into a byte buffer. Then you write that to the WASM memory. Then you pass the offset, which is basically a pointer, and the size to the guest. And then in the guest, you access the memory segment, and you deserialize the data. Then you do your application logic with your types, and so things make sense. You serialize the data again, pass the offset the, and the size back to the host, and then in the host, you access that specific memory segment and don't segfault, right? And then deserialize, okay? And then you continue with your host logic. And the, the problem with this is this is a lot of steps to have to do just to do a simple hello world, right? Uh, not to mention you have to figure out how to serialize things correctly and how to do so uh, without so many headaches. So <clears throat> serialization matters a lot. It matters quite a bit at this point. Um, and that's at least right now because uh, WebAssembly is a relatively new technology. The uh, core spec is currently being developed. Um, in fact, next week we'll be in Munich working with the community group from the W3C on sort of like these next big steps that are happening with the core. And um, right now, though, serialization is the key, and it will be for quite a long time. Um, so libraries, in this case, do the heavy lifting of serializing and uh, creating the glue code for these, for these steps. And the major players here are these four. Um, has anyone used Wasm Bindgen? Anybody? No? OK, so Wasm Bindgen is uh, sort of a standard that's used on the web. When you hear about WebAssembly for the first time, if you dig a little bit further, you'll realize that there's a close linking with Rust, right? Uh, Wasm Bindgen is a Rust library that lets you write JavaScript in Rust, and then it takes care of this serialization and glue code for you. Um, but if you're not a Rust developer, uh, it's Rust sometimes doesn't have the greatest reputation for getting up to speed quickly. Um, uh, but it is a cool language, but still, Wasm Bindgen, which is one of the foremost ones, is written in Rust. And then the following three can be used in either environment, right? Wit Bindgen is kind of based off of Wasm Bindgen, and Wit Bindgen is used to do the same thing, typically in a server-side environment. Then you can use a classic JSON, JSON, whatever you want to say, right? And then, uh, and then Polyglot, which is a, a library that we built, which we're going to talk about today also. So <clears throat> to kind of look through these, uh, Wasm Bindgen was one of the earliest host guest implementations. Um, WebAssembly 1.0 was stabilized in 2019, I believe, in all the four major browsers. And around that time, Wasm Bindgen became uh, really, really popular and started to be used. And everyone thought that if you're a JavaScript developer, you should start to learn Rust, and there was kind of a push with Rust for that. Um, it's also, it's also uh, used in Node environments, too. So if you're a Node developer and you want to use WebAssembly, Wasm Bindgen is a good place to look for that kind of stuff if you're, if you're uh, interested in using Rust also. <clears throat> and the buffer that we talked about, the WASM linear memory, is just a shared array buffer. The problem here, though, is that when we go from the uh, separate secure stack that is the WebAssembly VM back to uh, V8 or whatever JavaScript VM you have, 
these, these calls back to the host can be relatively expensive, right? Not to mention you have to deal with the serialization, you also have to deal with the actual calls themselves across VMs, right? Um, so that is one drawback to this, and um, you'll, you'll hear that sometimes people in the early days thought about WebAssembly as like a magic pixie dust uh, for performance in the browser, and it, it turns out that that's not quite true, um, but in very specific cases, it's very true, right? One, one famous example is Figma, um, where they uh, built their shader library based on these old C++ implementations that were massive, right? They were able to do a lot of this computation in the WASM VM in the browser, which allowed them to build their products um, in browsers, which was kind of ahead of its time. Um, but the difference there is they were doing a lot of compute in the WASM VM without crossing, without crossing the guest host boundary very often, right? That's the real key. So too much IO, kind of like too many syscalls or too many libc invocations on, uh, on the server, uh, uh, this can become expensive, right? So if you want to check this out, uh, the MDN docs for WebAssembly are a great place to get started. They have them built in and also um, Mozilla was very uh, early in uh, the creation of WebAssembly, and they have some really great explainer docs there. So, okay, JSON. We all use JSON, right? Uh, I don't know though. This is Java, so maybe XML is the thing to do. I'm I'm not sure, but no, no, no. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, j we're pretty familiar with this. I probably don't need to explain this to this crowd, but uh, simple encoding and decoding very familiar to web devs, right? And um, We'll just do a quick example. So uh, if we look here, I'm just gonna talk about this. I'm not going to do too many uh, examples. This is Rust, so please forgive me, but I think that it's uh, pretty simple. You'll be able to follow most of it because um, um, it's, it's really not that different from Java, right? So here is an example where in this main function, we are setting up a WebAssembly engine Okay, here we're using WASM time, which is uh, a WASM runtime that's written in Rust. It's also the sort of standard uh, experimental engine that a lot of the new features get worked out on, too. Um, so here we're setting up the engine. Okay, we are finding the WASM sample that we have. Okay, we are loading a new module. We're linking it. We're instantiating it. All right, and then we have these different pieces of data, right? We have the body, this is basically just an HTTP request. We have the method, the URL, headers, etc. And then here we're doing the actual serialization, right? Where we're taking that structured data and we're just turning it into bytes, okay? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna shove that into this byte slice, into this uh, vec, and then we're going to execute the uh, WebAssembly function and it's gonna return back to the Rust host, all right? So the reason I'm mentioning this one first is because uh, JSON is not the fastest wire format, right? Uh, it's one that's really simple. It's basically, um, uh, you don't need to really set up your types. It kind of just does it for you, but it does that with a lot of uh, extra space, if you will, right? So taking this HTTP request where you just have a, a few strings um, and then you have like basically like a tuple and then uh, a body of some text. Uh, this is this is still pretty fast, right? To go back and forth across the uh, uh, from the host to the guest, just under 400 microseconds. Um, but I'm sure you can imagine that if you're doing this a lot, you get into millisecond territory, and then if you're doing things that are even bigger, like blobs, then then you may really have some problems. Yeah. Some of the benefits, though, are that JSON JSON is schemaless, right? You don't really have to set anything up; it'll just do it for you. Um, it's very easy to get started. You don't really have to know much about, uh, about the types that you're using, um, but it is slow. Yeah, it is slow. So uh, now we'll talk about WIT and WIT bindgen. This is sort of our second technique for getting things across the boundary here. Uh, WIT stands for the, web, uh, the WebAssembly interface types, right? And um, WebAssembly the actual core spec uh, is derived from a series of proposals that different people in the open source community submit and they work on different things and they champion them and then we try to present them to the group. And the WebAssembly interface types were a proposal to get higher level types into, uh, 
into the core spec so that it's easier to use than just returning floats and ints, right? Um, now, that's going to be sort of rolled into what is known as the component model, which the component model is sort of a forthcoming um, uh, part of the spec that's going to allow for basically strongly typed interfaces without having to do uh, extra tooling outside of the ecosystem. Um, uh, there are tools that exist for this now because companies like ours have needed to build things that can work today and that's something that uh, that that we've worked on um, to sort of make that available now but this will soon be sort of subsumed into the into the component model spec cool so uh, the difference here is I promise I, I won't show everyone too much rust yeah okay Okay, so the this looks familiar. Basically, uh, different in a, a different sense than JSON. Here, you need to define your types, right, and set them up, kind of like you do with gRPC or something where you need to define the types that go in and out to set up the contract. Okay, so this is a WIT file, right, kind of similar to a proto file maybe, um, but it takes this struct with these types uh, that are built in, a function that returns a string, uh, a string, and then another function that's exported. So um, the same thing happens here. This is the actual, uh, uh, yeah, this is the actual uh, function that is getting compiled. And if we look um, at the benchmarks, one thing that we can see is that for this same uh, uh, struct, right, we didn't use the component model tooling, but we did use WitBindGen, which is the library that actually creates the glue code that does the serialization on either side. Uh, round trip, we get about 165 microseconds with a wider range though, right? So what happens here is the serialization layer uh, does the serialization from the higher level types. It turns it into a uh, much more compact binary format. This is known as the canonical ABI. And then it, uh, on the other side, it will deserialize, serialize again, and then you do th the same thing back in the host. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the benefits of this, it, ooh, excuse me, it's a major feature in the component model, which like I said, the, the component model is uh, sort of a, a new thing in WebAssembly that is going to bring different layers of abstraction to WebAssembly modules to make them easier in terms of uh, strong types, um, strongly typed functions, but then also in terms of different system layers. So when we think about WebAssembly on the server, um, kind of in the same way that if anyone's done de debugging of Docker images, God forbid, uh, we have different layers of abstraction and the component model will work in a similar way where we have different layers of, of um, the system platform. So uh, it allows you to generate glue code for more than types, so for other things like functions, streams, things like this, um, interfaces, imports, exports, uh, functions, yep. And some of the drawbacks are that the component model tooling is required and that is under active development. So if you look at WIT or WIT Bungeon, you may notice that uh, things are changing quite a bit. In fact, I had to use a pinned version of this to, to do these benchmarks. So um, the thing there is that until the component model uh, specification gets included in WASM 1.0, then um, uh, this stuff will be relatively unstable until we get there. And it has a very tight coupling with these things, uh, especially with, um, uh, it's 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 not easy to use other tooling outside of it. Yeah, right. Yeah, and right now the most stable support is Rust. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> so so uh, I'll, although there is more tooling that's being developed for Go, it's being worked on. But then also for Java, for these for some of these languages that have things like garbage collection, this is a this is a different challenge, but actually something that um, is a little bit outside of the scope of this talk. But I'd be happy to talk about the sort of support that happens for Java for things like Python, Ruby, um, uh, which are forthcoming with some new proposals around GC. Okay. And then Polyglot. So Polyglot is a library that we built at Loophole Labs. Um, and the, our goal was a familiar DevX, but then also to be very, very fast. Okay. Um, and similarly, uh, what you can see is with Polyglot, we also have uh, we also have a contract, right? And the contract is very similar. Let me see if I can find it. There it is. 
The contract is set up with a proto file. So if you've ever used gRPC, protobufs, uh, this is the same exact thing. It's proto3 compliant. And this uh, contract basically allows you to then generate the glue code which is here, which does the encoding and the decoding. This is in Rust, but we also have tooling for, uh, <clears throat> for Go and for TypeScript, um, and possibly others coming soon. Uh, may or may not be including Java, too. So um, my boss is sitting here, so I'm trying to say things. Uh, I'm trying to hedge, you know. So <clears throat> the difference there is uh, really what we care about here is performance. So uh, the benchmarks for this, for this same HTTP request, was just at 100 microseconds, right? Which, you know, you need 10 of these to even get to a single millisecond, roughly, and um, we are even doing more improvements on the, on the execution speed of this uh, since, since I did these last benchmarks, right? So the interesting thing here is, um, is when we think about the performance hit of something like crossing the WASM guest and host boundary, uh, we, what we've noticed is that uh, people talk about the performance implica implications of context switching into kernel space, um, and this is on par or much faster than that, which becomes uh, very interesting for server-side WebAssembly development. Ah, and these are the people on our team who did a lot of the work, which is Confuse Qubit here and these other uh, members who worked on um, optimizing this. So. The benefits of Polyglot is that it's fast. It's a similar DevX to Protobufs. Uh, it's very familiar. Um, it powers scale signatures, which scale signatures are basically our version of typed functions, strongly typed functions, which for WebAssembly, like we said, out of the box, you get floats and ints returned. Um, what this basically gives you is uh, strongly typed functions for anything that you'd like to do. And what this can allow us to do then is to have true polyglot composability, right? This sort of idea that you could run multiple languages in WebAssembly um, as if they're in the same, uh, in the same environment. So drawbacks, uh, language support is still increasing, but we are working on that. And if you want to take a look at this, uh, you'll notice that tagline might look familiar. This is <clears throat> This is not uh, spam or anything like that, so the QR code uh, does, does work. But um, this is mostly the docs and uh, kind of gives you a short run through of how things work. So in comparison, you'll see that we have these three. I didn't uh, benchmark WASM BindGen because uh, the difference is I wanted to focus more on server-side <coughs> server WASM, excuse me. But you can see that uh, Jason being the slowest, then about, <clears throat> about three to four times faster, we have Polyglot and then Wit Bindgen in the, in the middle. The other thing I'll say about benchmarks uh, that I hope most of us are aware of is that they're highly context dependent, right? There's this idea that there are three kinds of lies, right? And I would say that statistics uh, might cover uh, software benchmarks. So, you know, we take these things with a grain of salt what really matters is your use case and how you're using it and whether it's fast enough for you, right? Um, who's heard of WASI? Has anyone heard of WASI? Cool. All right, so WASI is the WebAssembly system interface. Um, <clears throat> like we mentioned, WebAssembly is basically like a box that doesn't know anything about the outside world. It's as if you took like a little piece of x86 and you could run stuff in it, but it doesn't do anything else, right? If you want uh, a file system, if you want sockets, if you want these other things, you have to figure out how to provide those, right? The WebAssembly system interface uh, is sort of the effort that understands that that's not very tenable for a lot of situations. So running things like uh, uh, having a file system or having network access is sort of the responsibility of WASI. This is a newer subsystem that, that is being added to the spec and working on and being worked on quite a lot right now. Um, and basically, right now, it's, it's sort of like a thin POSIX layer around WASM for, for, for certain things. Uh, so for this, you can use things like stood in, stood out, right, to get data in and out, which makes this uh, serialization problem a little bit less, but there's still a cost, because uh, serialization still matters in that sense also. <clears throat> so further standards and the future of WASM. 
uh, the ways presented here are used across most popular projects that you'll come across in the server side space and on the uh, on 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 the on the client. Yeah, standards can move slowly, and <clears throat> one of the reasons for this is that uh, the major players in WebAssembly uh, are the four major browser companies, right? And they've learned the lesson the hard way from the browser wars of the 90s that uh, it's better that if we're going to eventually have something that should be implemented everywhere, we should cooperate, right? So um, there's definitely frustration around some of the speed with which certain WASM pr proposals move, but that's for very good reason. Um, future features, like the component model, are very exciting because it sort of allows uh, um, you know, out of the box, higher level types, but then also with other, other things that will uh, increase um, the usability and also the performance. So the TLDR for the component model is that you'll get things like linking interfaces and virtualization uh, for free. Changes to passing data across the host guest and in between modules. You'll you'll notice that I didn't uh, talk about how you can link modules at runtime or or before, uh, but there it is absolutely possible to have modules talk to each other. And doing that is uh, sort of been an, an open question, but there's going to be more implementation of that with future proposals. So serialization there will matter less. Uh, specifically, you'll have things like resource and handle types, which are similar to pointers, except uh, it will be able to, to control the lifecycle, so you won't have to deal with things like null references, etc. Cool. Um, so uh, that kind of covers the meat and potatoes of this talk. Uh, we're from Loophole Labs. Um, this is our information. Um, for me personally, my name is Dan. Um, I would love to talk with anyone else here who has more questions about WebAssembly. And um, this is my information if you'd like to get in touch. So thanks very much. And uh, I finished a little early. So if there are questions, I'd be happy to uh, take any about anything in the, uh, in the realm. I'll try not to cough in the meantime. Yeah. That is an excellent question. Okay, so for the people in the back, that was uh, he asked, "What is the state of garbage collection support in WebAssembly?" And <clears throat> um, if we could have some real support in the next year, the short answer is uh, possibly yes. Uh, and the more technical answer is that the the GC proposal has been added to the spec, and in fact, in all the major browsers, it was behind a feature flag up until literally just a couple months ago. And now it's now it's shipped in every major in every major browser. What that means, though, however, is that the the GC uh, addition to the core spec of WASM is very very conservative. Right, so what this means now is that tool chains and compilers need to figure out how they're going to leverage that for uh, WASM compilation. And um, LLVM has already done this, like so, like that's fine. So with the modules that, with for compilers that leverage the L LLVM toolchain, that's good to go. But then they're like um, for like TVM, I'm not sure about their status with that yet with Java. But the idea here is that you have an abstract enough representation in the WASM VM to allow for uh, a, a uh, language's GC without having to bring the entire thing yourself. Because right now what you have to do, if you take JavaScript, if you take Ruby, if you take Python, you have to bring the entire runtime to WebAssembly and ship that with your, with your code, right? Obviously that's not ideal. Although I will say, uh, even doing that is still orders of magnitude smaller than a Docker image, so so that's that's an interesting thing, but it it doesn't have to be that bad. So yeah, GC support is like so. Basically, the short answer is that it has landed, uh, but uh, the actual work to get it implemented is is like really starting with the tool chains now, right? Yeah, you know, that's a great question though. Yeah. Other questions about WebAssembly or WASI? Okay, well, thanks again. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming.